All right, my guest today is guitarist Trip Eisen. He was a member of Static X, Dope, and Murder Dolls. Uh, if you know the story at all, you know that he had some legal troubles, and that ended his career for a while. And he's very open and candid about that. We're going to discuss it in depth. Does he feel guilt? Does he deserve a second chance? I'll let you decide that. Plus, he's going to tell us about the new projects he's working on, including a new Static X style band and a podcast about his time in Dope and Static X. All this and more coming right up. So, yeah, so what I kind of want to do is just kind of tell your whole story because I think there's it's it's an interesting story and there's a lot of gaps that I don't know about you. I feel like I've learned a lot, but I st still I want to fill in the gaps. Um, so if we could just start at the beginning, I don't even know your I know a little bit about your background. You're from Pennsylvania. Are you from Lansdale? Is that the name? No, no, I'm from a uh, small town, Penargil. OK, um, the small town in Pennsylvania I grew up in Slate Belt. You know. <laughs> so what was your family upbringing like your brothers and sisters? Like what kind of were you the good kid, the bad kid, the band dork? Like what kind of kid were you? Yeah, I was a band dork. Me and my brother were both in, you know, band, you know, like marching band, concert band. You know, it was music from like day one almost, you know, piano lessons and music and band trumpet. I played trumpet and marching band. So definitely musical background. And then I picked up guitar because of Kiss and everything. So I picked up guitar at age 13. So so 13, that's about the yeah, usually about the age of kids get into more like rock stuff rather than the mm -hmm. classical and the boring music, as I would call it when I was a kid. Yeah. 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 So it was like Kiss, yeah. the main thing, influence. I mean, I feel like that's a big one for a lot of people. Yeah, Kiss was big. Uh, I actually heard Alice Cooper schools out, man. That was like something that that was the first like metal guitar thing I heard on the pop radio. I'm like, -na -na, like, wow, what's that? And I was like, wow, schools out. I was into that song, but didn't motivate me to play guitar. Kiss is what motivated me to play guitar and then everything, you know? <laughs> Okay, so then you joined the band uh, Tease. Was that your first band that you had been in, or you, had you been in other bands before that? Oh yeah, band since junior high. You know, playing concerts, and I was on stage at age fifteen playing concerts. Playing, so you had Ted Nugent on recently, right? <laughs> the yeah. first I ever did like live concert. I did a couple, you know, band things like with my rock band for like you know uh, school performances, but. The first like real public live performance, we came out and I opened with Great White Buffalo, just as like a little intro. We didn't play the whole song, but just like an intro. It was like, so Ted Nugent kind of like sprung my rock and roll career out. But but then we were playing Kiss, Rush, like Cheap Trick, Ramones, you know, a lot of cool covers. But Tease came along when I was like 20 years old. Okay, so about... Yeah, because they they start. You joined them in '86, right? So yeah, for like was a band I was going to see when I was a teenager, and I idolized them. They were like the local rock gods. They were like Motley Crue meets Twisted Sister, Shock Rock, Fire Blood, and freaking the crazy stage show Rags. Did you did you see pictures of them? I uh, yeah, I've, like, I've, I've seen the music video. I think what the era that I saw was more when it was like Rough House and it was they had changed the name, obviously, and it was kind of more glam rock. I didn't see the blood and the shock rock uh, part. Yeah, like, yeah, the early when I went to see them, they were like the shock rock. I joined them. We were still carrying over. There was the poison Cinderella era. It was still but then, you know, it slowly because of Bon Jovi and Guns N' Roses, all of a sudden cowboy boots and you know, not as much makeup. And I, I was more into the shock rock. I was in the wasp, twisted sister, kiss. I was more into the crazy shock rock stuff. So that's why well, T, but, yeah. but I couldn't, you know, when rough house changed, when they evolved, you know, it was still fun. I played it. It was rock and roll. I, you know, it was, you know, kind of metal, some of the riffs. So, you know, it was fun. Yeah. And then you guys got a record deal and uh, your, your debut was actually produced by Max Norman. Tell me yep. about working with him because he produced all the Ozzy records and Megadeth and oh. also Dangerous Toys, which I'm a fan of. Yeah, Dangerous Toys. He did Armored Saint. Um, I think he did uh, not Death Angel, um, another band from back then. Uh, some really good metal bands. But yeah, it was great working with him. He was like his British sense of humor and uh, 
every it was just great you know he taught us a lot um the album wasn't quite as heavy as what we were hoping for you know he did dirty looks i don't know if you know dirty looks mm, yeah 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 that he did so we we wanted a harder edge like that but you know he was he thought we would do better you know being a little bit more commercial so i don't know it it was an experiment you know but so what fun. happened with that band? What was the peak of that? Like, did you guys do any big tours with any bands or are you just open mostly for uh, when big bands would come locally? Yeah, we played, um, we played uh, our own tour. We toured and then we opened up for a few national acts. Like we opened up for Eddie Money at some arenas and we opened up, we, we replaced Vixen on a tour and then we did our own touring, you know? So, but they, Rough House previously tease had their own following when i joined the band when i was 20 21 years old i was like instant rock star i was like playing and there were people lined up around the block already they, they were already selling out because they made a name for themselves with a, a release they put out a tease album and i mean i you know i was there i was one of those kids waiting in line you know and then i got to join the band it was like a dream come true it was amazing you know yeah, and then you yeah. even made that music video uh, tonight, which I think is kind of a catchy song. I'm I, guilty pleasure. I guess I liked it. Did they play yeah. that on MTV? Yeah, yeah, it was on MTV. It, it made. They had something called the top, whatever countdown at the time, and it, we got on the top countdown a couple times. The uh, the debut of that video, Zach Wild and Ozzy were hosting Headbangers Ball. Oh, that's cool. Um, and then. Uh, but Adam um, Adam Curry was one of the BJs that debuted it too. I think he did a little news segment about us. But I mean, we were in all the magazines, Hit Parader. So it was like my first go around. It was like it was pretty crazy. We got on the cover of one magazine called Rock Scene. So it was a little taste of success. It was cool. Yeah. yeah no, I mean, it, you must have felt like a big rock star, like you had made it. So then, what happened with that band? I know the scene changed, but I think the band ended before that happened, right? It. No, the scene was, yeah, it was changing. I mean, I left the band in December of 89. So it was like the end of the 80s. So I was kind of like, let's start the new decade with something different. I ended up playing in different metal, you know, glam metal bands, you know, in the early 90s and stuff. So, so is that what you, and you did a couple of uh, projects with uh, Dave Weekly, who was the singer in Rough House, right? Uh, the Rights well, and Ego. He, he was the bass player. Yeah, he. I'm sorry, bass he, player. Yeah, he became my really good friend. I had a lot of chemistry with Dave. So I invited him to play in The Right, a band called The Right. And that uh, is a band I started with the uh, the drummer from Dope. The drummer ended up playing in Dope. So that's when, like, 92, 93, I started working with Preston Nash. Dave Weekly played with me in that project. And Ego was more of a what I was end up playing, like industrial metal. But, but rewind a little bit. I, I got the audition for Marilyn Manson in 96. So oh. Matt, Matt had in the village voice. I answered the yeah, guitar player one. It was right after their second album, which is an EP, you know, uh, right before Andy Christ Superstar. So they, I, I flew down to, um, to New Orleans and audition at Trent Reznor's studio. It's pretty cool. Wow. So they, How many people were like, going up against at that point? There were 20 people chosen out of 400. Okay, so you made it down to the final 20. And then was that when, uh, did, was John Five in it then? Oh, I'm trying to. Oh, when Zimzum was one of those 20 people. Okay. And he, so Zimzum, he got... he's the guitar player that was on Antichrist Superstar. Right, the... okay. So, so, yeah, so Zimzum and I rode in the cab together to the audition. <laughs> His real name's Michael. So I rode with Zimzum. And after the audition, it was, it was a moment in time because it's like a, the audition was like, you perform at Trent Reznor's studio, recording studio, and they put on big speakers on over, over the PA their album, and you play four, five, six songs, and you plug into a Marshall, and you're just playing to their album, and they sit on the couch and watch you. So you got to perform like a monkey, you know. <laughs> and Manson, Twiggy, Pogo, Trent Reznor, and their manager was all there. What pretty a lot of pressure. <laughs> Yeah. So, and that's before Manson was a big star, obviously, but Trent Reznor, he was pretty famous. So you knew this was going to be a pretty big project. No, I mean, Manson was already infamous after the first two releases he put out. He was already infamous. Oh, already okay. Famous. This was after that. Okay. Gotcha. Gotcha. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Was, yeah. His first one was like 93 or 94, right? 
by 94, yeah. 95 was Sweet Dreams. And then I auditioned in 96, right before Antichrist. Mm -hmm. So the audition went so good. I felt so confident. And uh, they said, hang around. And then they said, you're still in the running. And uh, mm -hmm. I went home and they said, they chose somebody, but to hang on, you're still in the running. And uh, we might call on you if something doesn't work out. So I was in touch with the manager, um, Tony Ciola, for a little while. Um, I used to get into all the Madsen shows. It was pretty cool. <laughs> but it just didn't didn't work out. So when you looked back, though, like at Rough House and you left that band, I mean, that's a pretty big gap um, for when you auditioned to Manson. Like during that time, like what did you look back on Rough House that, that you learned from like mistakes that you made? Go, oh, I'd never if I ever get another band, I'm not doing this again. Well, I I I would have not quit the band. I would have stuck it out a little longer because mm -hmm. I felt like I quit and they were still playing to big crowds like why am, why am i quitting because i was like oh i didn't like the style they were changing their style it yeah. was getting too bluesy and too i don't know so that's another reason it was musical differences but <laughs> um and then they lost the record deal too you know it's like it just didn't work out it was like a one-shot thing but i i just learned that you know you, you got to like change with the times a little bit more or you got to experiment a little bit more you know so okay i was big into Jane's Addiction at the time. So when Manson came out, Jane's Addiction was like cutting edge, red hot chili peppers. I was like listening to some, you know, different things. And, and then I was always into thrash. I loved Metallica, Overkill, Man of War, Slayer, you know, all that stuff was playing into my development too. Like all the guys in Ruffles were always like, why are you playing with this glam band? You're into thrash metal. I'm like, no, I like both. I like both thrash and glam. I like Motley Crue and I like Slayer. And that's why I hit it all with Joey Jordison, because Joey Jordison was like, dude, I'm into Slayer and I'm into Motley Crue. I'm into Glam and I'm into Thrash. And like, there's this now it's not as unique to be more diverse, but mm -hmm. things weren't as diverse. You take it for granted now. Things weren't yeah. quite as diverse back then. Like, it's like, oh, are you a thrasher? You know, you go to concerts back then. It would be like, oh, there's skinheads here at this hardcore show. They might want to beat up the long hairs. I mean, things were tense back in back in those days. Yeah, now people are more open minded now. You know? Right. So those, so for those eight years from 89 to 97, before you start form dope, you're just in like a bunch of different bands. Are you doing like day jobs and stuff too? Or? Yeah, so, yeah, definitely. But that Manson audition was pivotal, though I didn't make it. Mm. The fact in the running, I was in the top five. Of, and the fact that I had an interaction with Manson and it's funny, Trent Reznor, um, he, it was his you know, it was a funeral home turned into a studio. It's this amazing thing in New Orleans. Hmm. And I had this little doll. I should have brought it. I had this little doll. It was like, it looked like Chucky, but it was this little stuffed doll about this big. And it was like a good luck charm. But it looked this, like this creepy doll. It was like, a, and Trent Reznor's dogs went into my bag where I had it. And they pulled it out and they ripped it apart. They were stuffing everywhere. And Trent Reznor came over to me. He's like, oh, I'm so sorry. Was that doll precious to you? I'm so sorry. I'll pay for it. And he was apologizing to me. He had like two Rottweilers or something. And I was like, mm, that's all right. I gathered the stuffing and I put it all together. I was like, this is a, I'm like, that's all right. You know, what's it worth? It was 50 cents in a thrift store. Yeah. But some, at, the, at that point, I used to joke around and bring it with me places, put it up on my amp. So it was sentimental. But the girlfriend, my next girlfriend I had, throughout uh, all the dope and static X days, she took this doll and she sewed it, carefully sewed it back together for me. So I still have it. She sewed it back. So it's the Trent Reznor dog tragedy. That Billy like the sewed. real Chucky where it's like, he's all sewn back together. Like he's got the... uh, yeah. <laughs> That's this cool. Doll, it was just so crazy. I almost had like human type hair. I called it Billy. It was my Billy doll. Hmm. So it was kind of a little junior Chucky, but yeah, it was, but it was neat. You know, I was like, and then, and then Manson, um, Halloween of that year, Halloween of 96, I got to go to the show because it's called up the manager, got on the list. It was this Halloween show where Manson was going to commit suicide. That was like the rumor. Manson's going to commit suicide on stage on Halloween 96, Antichrist superstar. That was, it was a thing, I guess. <laughs> you know, wow. But, I didn't know, I even know, but I don't remember that. That's crazy. It, it was, yeah, it was a thing before. So the, did he I mean, do, I mean, yeah, he obviously didn't really do it, but he did like no. a fake suicide or something or? I don't know. I don't know if he just started the rumor just to get, you know, some publicity. Who knows what? I don't know. Maybe someone else started the rumor like Gene Simmons drinks cow's blood or Angus Young vomits on stage. You know, there's just different rumors. But um, 
we went to the show. So after the show, I'm hanging out and I wanted to say hello to Manson, but he was busy doing interviews. But I was hanging out with the rest of the band and Twiggy and all these guys and joking around with them. And uh, I had Twiggy autograph my ass. I got a picture of that. I got to post that. <laughs> so later that night, I, I had given Twiggy a VHS tape because I was like, I want you guys to remember me. So I did all this outrageous stuff that I can't even mention on this VHS tape. I filmed me doing all kinds of crazy stuff. And uh, I gave it to Twiggy with a little note. And then he, I, I, as I was getting home from the concert, me and my buddy walked in. And we had those old answer machines. We're like, you know, they're leaving a message on a cassette, right? As I'm walking in the door, Manson's leaving a voicemail for me. Say, hey, we got your tape here. We're watching it on the bus. And I pick up the phone and I'm talking to Manson. I don't know if I still have this on, on the cassette. And he's like, wow, dude, we love this. Man, maybe we picked the wrong guy. And he's like kind of busting Zim Zim's balls on the bus. He's like, yeah, wow, now we're watching this video. Maybe we picked the wrong guy for the band. Yeah. And he was just busting balls, but it was pretty funny. Wow. That's really cool. So then how did that, did that have anything to do with you forming Dope with uh, Edsel and Simon? Not really. It's just a okay. funny coincidence that Edsel was friends with, couple guys in Manson, Ginger Fish and Daisy. He was friends with these guys because he lived in Florida. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I think he was roommates with Ginger or something. So when he found out he got a guy like me who auditioned for Manson and, you know, had this background and I love Manson and Dope is kind of a Manson, you know, family oriented derivative type of band, like similar uh, elements. So I loved it. You know, the industrial metal. I was already doing that with Ego. So it just was a natural progression. It wasn't a stretch, you know to do dope so it was a lot of fun but yeah it, it led it was like it seems like a long time like 89 to 96 when i auditioned for manson and mm -hmm. late night when i started ego so it was like it's just kind of i was writing songs i remember some of the songs i was writing on the plane ride back from new orleans i was writing these songs lyrics that ended up being on some static x albums later like some of the lyrics i wrote on that plane ride back from new orleans end up on a static x album i'm just surprised that you didn't give up Cause you're thinking like you're, you had it in rough house. You're like, you're a rock star. You made it. But then it took like seven years. Like a lot of people in those seven years might give up, might start a family, might get a different job or something and just go, ah, I'm giving up on this rock star stuff. But you, you just, did you always like see, have your sights set on continuing to be successful musician? Oh yeah, of course. Always, always never gave up on it. It seemed pretty, I mean, even right now, I, I 10 years, I didn't play, play on stage. And I played on stage finally in 2016. So like there, there's there's periods of time that, you know, it, it happens and you just keep going. You know, the story about Mark Twain. There's some people who reach their zenith later in life, you know. So why can't you have different eras of your life and you progress, you learn. And uh, yeah, it was it was a, to me, it was I was younger. It was a darker time. Like, oh, I was depressed. Am I ever going to do this again? And I just never stopped the Manson audition and meeting Ed Soul. And it's like everything plays together. Wayne Static always said, everything happens for a reason. You know, I don't know if he truly believed that, but you know, it's it's a nice sentiment. Things happen for a reason. Well, luck, preparation, and believing in yourself and not giving up, you know. Yeah. So then you you form this band Dope and it's like you're back, basically. You guys put out this album and then I mean you toured with Slipknot, Stained. Coal Chamber, Fear Factory, Seven Dust. I mean, basically all the big bands of the 90s, early 2000s. Uh, talk about what that was like to come back. That must have been fun. You're like, finally. Well, it was in 98. It was the club days for Dope when we were showcasing 98, when we formed the band. And it was Edsel's vision. He had a couple guys. And I brought in Preston Nash on drums. And then the record deal happened. and. I was me and Preston were like the guy, the guitar player was just not cutting it. So my buddy AC Slade, I was like, we got to get AC in the band. Now AC opened up for one of our shows after the record deal. We, we did another show in New York and AC's band opened up. And I'm like, we got to get AC. So we uh, fought long and hard to get him in the band and months of bickering and debating and <laughs> cajoling. Finally, AC becomes the bass player. And I was the bass player, but I convinced Ed Soldier, like, let me play guitar and move AC into bass. It'd be a better mix. So the results speak for themselves, right? <laughs> you know? Yeah. So, so, no. so great. I mean, the first tour we did, 
the monumental first tour, which was only two weeks, but it was so impressionable, was Orgy. We o- opened up for Orgy. Um, and we were living in an RV. I mean, some bands go for years in an RV. We spent a few months in an RV, but those few months were, you know, our hard times. I broke was that my before foot. you were signed or after you had been signed? No, no this, is, this is the tour. So we're okay. signed. We're going on tour. The record company got us a tour. So this is 99, a couple months before the album release. You start touring pre-album coming out. Mm. So um, we get uh, going and we're on tour, on the Orgy tour. And I'm playing in Minneapolis. I can't remember the name of the club, but it was Prince's Club, a club that Prince built. <clears throat> and I'm always wanting to interact with the crowd so i put my foot between the monitors i put my foot out in the barricade and then i go back and my foot gets caught in the monitor and i go backwards and break my foot on stage and i feel something crunching around in my boot i'm like this doesn't feel right i end up in the emergency room after the show the, i start going to panic attack oh my first tour i blew i'm blowing it oh i'm gonna have to wear a cast am i gonna have to go home well luckily it just it was just a boot just had to put a boot on oh. so there's the me there's video of me playing with this boot on and i'm still jumping <laughs> i'm still jumping and just landing on my good foot like, i can't sacrifice the show i gotta keep performing and and so it was like dude you're jumping you're not supposed to jump you gotta heal <laughs> yeah so that I, was kind of part of your your stick early on was like the stage stuff like you jumped around and ran and, and did lots of crazy stuff right Absolutely. Yeah, absolutely. It was, it was pushing the limits to everything, performing and, you know, bands like Kiss, Van Halen, that never stop on stage. There's constant, you know, it's a show. It's not, you're not going to just stand. I'm going to stand there and play, you know, it's like energy, energy. And there's been other people, there's, there's certain key members in certain bands that inspired me, you know, obviously Gene Simmons, Paul Stanley, Angus Young, Prince, Dave Lee Roth, all of Van Halen, you know, just like there's certain performers that just step it up. And um, so I'm on crutches now. The orgy tour is winding down. We're going over to the Fear Factory tour. I'm on crutches. And I'm walking on crutches and I got this boot on. So we get down to Orlando, Florida after like a 22 hour RV ride. My girlfriend flies down, but I'm like, the air conditioning broke. So like, we're taking this ride from Iowa to like Florida or something. And I'm up in the crow's nest in an RV, if you know what that is. And I'm like sweating and like my foot's, uh, and we get to Florida and um, we're doing the first show with Fear Factory and Static X. So we're backstage and we get to meet everybody at the House of Blues or I think in Orlando. And then, uh, you know, Wayne and Ken and Tony, like the guys from Static X, like meet me for the first time. Like, hey, my name's Trip, and I'm on crutches. Like, whoa. Is that your nickname because you're always falling or something? <laughs> it was just a funny moment. I remember like, oh, your name's, Tri- is that a joke? Your name's Trip and you're on crutches. <laughs> you got to cast. Good. I wouldn't have even put that together. So that's, yeah. where, you, that's where you guys met uh, all the Static X people is on, is on the tour. So then when their guitarist leaves, you, you, were you the one that reached out to them to audition or did they call you? Well, the connection was made already. Um, when you're on tour, you meet people. Yeah. Sometimes you connect. Sometimes you make a connection and you remain friends. Sometimes you're just tour buddies. Like, hey, everybody's tour mm-hmm. buddies, pictures. But me and Wayne made a connection. We exchanged numbers. He's calling me. You know, we stayed in touch. So it was more than just tour. Like, for some reason, we had a connection. We ended up at the phone the uh, payphone all the time at the same time we're like on tour he's getting to the payphone i'm getting to the payphone at the same time to call our girlfriends at home mm-hmm. now that was a weird era of, uh of well why would you be using a payphone if you have a cell phone because we had cell phones out on tour but at that time you had a little code you put in the payphone it's cheaper than calling from your cell phone mm-hmm. so you're like all right sweetheart i'm gonna call you from the payphone and Oh, you're at the payphone already. All right, let me know when you're done, Trip. Like we both end up at the payphones at the clubs at the same time. So hmm. we were both we had this connection, and then like we start talking. He's into Kiss and Rush. I'm into Kiss and Rush, the two bands that we grew up on. And you know, he's similar personality. We're like low key kind of, and you know, certain certain things that we connected on. So I, I exchanged numbers. I didn't exchange numbers with a lot of people. You know, 
but he's the one. And, and so when their guitar player left, I don't remember who reached out. To, I don't even remember who reached hmm. out to who they put word out or, but I already had Wayne's numbers. I just called him up. I said, Hey, I heard, uh, I heard Koichi left. So maybe he didn't want to call me and steal me from dope. So maybe me calling him saying, Hey dude, I'm out of dope. I'm free. I'm a free agent. You know? so, oh, did you quit before you joined Static X? <clears throat> yeah, it's weird. Like Koichi leaving Static X, me leaving Dope almost happened simultaneously. It's weird, right? Oh, I thought you left Static X because you got that job and then you quit Dope. So you quit Dope without a job lined up. I didn't quit. I was fired. <laughs> oh, okay. I don't know if I knew that. What was that for? personality creative differences sort of thing but it's it's not like the way edsel tells it's like oh you were fired eh, not so much i was fired and then he took me out to dinner a beautiful candlelit dinner and he's like listen let's try to work something out here so he wanted me to come back in the band and i just you know we were talking about it. i said well listen i need a more of a piece of the action because i was like you know, it was in the forming time of dope and it wasn't like you're a hired gun. You know, when we did dope, it wasn't like you're a hired gun this is my band. It was like, yeah, it's his band. It's his vision. But we're all in this together. We're all fighting hard. We're all getting street team together. We're all working hard, putting gear in our, our cars and moving things around and promoting the shows. And his and my girlfriend always went out flyering shows, going to the Rob Zombie show, the Ministry show, the Nine Inch Nails show, the Manson show, handing out flyers, all our girl, girls dressed up sexy handing out hey come see dope come see dope so like our girls are working together on this and you know so like when i get fired it's it's a long story i mean it's not it, it was a little bit because i was playing with joey jordison there was a little bit of jealousy going on so i was playing with joey jordison in the region right, that was the overlap was murder dolls was in between right, right. yeah right so i i once again i connected with joey jordison we hit it off and he offers me he's like dude I'm, I'm doing a side project you're awesome i want you to play with me i want you to play in my band my my side project which is a band the rejects that predates slipknot or was a contemporary with slipknot from what he told me back then the rejects were bigger in des moines iowa than slipknot was hmm. slipknot side project that they all had from other bands they were all playing in. oh i didn't wow so, okay yeah like weird so it's like i don't know the whole des moines iowa scene but apparently the rejects so Corey Taylor, Paul Gray, different people's of Slipknot were in the Rejects at one point and another. So when I joined the Rejects, Corey Taylor saw me once. He's like, dude, you're in the Rejects. Cool. I was in that band once. You know, it was like this cool thing. So um, it was a moment in time. So I was, I went out and played with the, the Rejects, did an amazing show, test show in uh, Des Moines, Iowa, and uh, working on music and stuff. And Edsel just didn't like it. It's like, you got to be more dedicated to dope. And I was like, this is going to just help dope that I'm playing with Joey Jordison it might help dope. Maybe, you know, it's like, it's, it's good vibe, but he just rubbed them the wrong way. It was an era where you, I don't know, side projects. I don't know if they would look at it. It was just, everybody looks at things differently. So, mm -hmm. but that kind of led him to saying you're fired, but it also, there was another dynamic going on, which story that's never been told, which is, we brought another friend of ours into the band, which is Virus, a.k.a. Andre. So we brought Virus into the band as a bass player. We were reformatting re Dope. And, uh, you know, there's different things happen. It's a little bit political, but it ended up being, you know, like, all right, we got another guy in the band. So it was kind of like firing me, but then he wanted me back in. And so it's not cut and dry, like anything with families and bands it's like the story's a little more complex but you break it down was he just didn't like me playing with joey jordison you know now edsel brags all his band oh i got one guy from the misfits one guy's playing with david draymond this guy's doing this he's bragging about what everybody's doing whereas before it was like no uh you gotta be more dedicated to dope you know and maybe back then there's a different dynamic going on but it, but regardless when i joined static x one of the first tours we got was opening for slipknot all across Europe. And Joey Jordison said to me, he goes, listen, you know, I don't like Static X. You know, they're okay. I, I like them as people, but it's like, they're not my thing. He goes, you're, we're taking you out on tour because of you, not because I like Static X, it's because you're my friend. That's why you're going on tour in Europe. 
So that would have been dope if I was still in dope. But it's mm. in the step X. So like there's all these different dynamics going on at the same time. So I think, you know, uh, you know, looking at it like, oh, you were fired from dope. Yeah, yeah, I was. It was traumatic. But I still had playing with Joey Jordison. Then I kind of found out Koichi left Static X. And these are connections that I made good hearted, like like substantive connections with Joey Jordison on musical styles and he was watching me from the side of the stage night after night you know he like caught my vibe and he knew what i wanted to do and he told me what the rejects was going to be and i was like dude i you know i know i know i can do it too you know it was my type of thing glam just like tease go back rewind to tease right shock rock glam shock rock that's what the rejects was going to be the shock rock glam i was going to bring a lot of my elements from tease and rough house into the rejects into the murder dolls and you know what happened with the murder dolls it's that type of thing shock rock motley mm-hmm. crew you know f the world type of thing so yeah no i love know. that band it's cool good stuff so yeah so then you joined static x and then it's like i mean like i said you'd already kind of you'd made it once with uh rough house and then you made it again with dope and now you're like basically you're going to the next level with static x though because these guys did, I mean, you guys did some crazy, you toured with everybody. I mean, OzFest, Ozzy, Pantera, Slayer, Linkin Park, STP. I mean, is there anyone that you didn't tour with? We didn't tour with Rob Zombie. <laughs> oh, or Marilyn Manson, I don't think, did you? Right. No, no. no okay. so, at a movie premiere. <laughs> yeah, but like so Corn and Seven Dust. I mean, there was a like Godsmack. Yeah. I mean, there was some of the biggest huge bands. So life was good at this point then, right? Yes. That, well, yeah, Pantera. Slayer Extreme Steel Tour was one of the best. That was great. Okay. So, yeah, so paint a picture of, like, 2005. Like, before this incident happens where your world comes crashing down, like, life is pretty good, right? Like, things are – but I, I – see, I've never been in a band. So explain this to me. Like, how common is it, it – I've seen, like, the dirt. So is it stuff – Is girl are girls coming backstage and on tour buses all the time? Is that just, like, a common thing in bands? Um – it's it, it it's not as crazy as what the 80s was you know but yeah it's it's semi common yeah it happens okay so th- this is something like you you're i mean you don't have a girlfriend at the, at the time in 2005 you're you're a single guy right mm-hmm. living it up as a, in the rock star life yep living it up yep yeah, yep yeah. Okay, so you and you've, you're very very open about this you've talked about this you made a mistake we don't need to go into the details but mm-hmm. some things happened you're arrested. You, you plead guilty, which I think is interesting too, because you could have tried to get out of it or tried to hire a high price lawyer, but you full on admitted your mistake at the, even at the time. Right. Right. Correct. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, my, it, was, it was like, you're not going to fight it. You get a plea bargain and you just, you know, you accept responsibility. I accepted responsibility and I just took it, you know, I just did what I had to do. And it was, it was, uh, it was, something I you know it's like I made a mistake I have to pay the price for it and you know there was never like oh let's go to trial it was ne- never never a consideration so there were two incidents were those the only two incidents with with this uh mm-hmm. situation or was there other things that just were never uh where you never got caught for well yeah no I mean this is all I know about so it's like yeah it's it was it was an incident and you know that like yeah like what happens in rock and roll you know it's like you you make mistakes and you do things that are irresponsible. So I did something irresponsible and I, uh, you know, who knows, you know, a lot, a lot of people do a lot of different things. You don't know what, what the consequences are really to you get, you know, held accountable, you know? Right. So, cause you're just, so some, you don't know like what's going on with some of this stuff with the girls, like you don't know their ages and things. When they're, cause like, that's what I'm saying. Like, I don't know what it's like to be in a rock, band. are there girls just coming in and out of backstage in the tour bus? Like, it, I don't know. Yeah. I mean, yeah, I, I don't want to like cast any aspersions of any, anybody else, but yeah, like there's a lot of irresponsible behavior going on. It's a culture, you know, it's like, you know, what happened with me is, is something that may or may not be commonplace in the music industry. Right. You know, there's a lot of, People have told stories. We all hear the stories about the idols back in the day, Led Zeppelin, Kiss, you know, Motley Crue, Rat, all this <clears throat> poison, all those crazy stories. And yeah, I mean, 
there's a lot, of, I'm sure there's a lot of irresponsible behavior that went on. And all you can do is like pick up the pieces when, when things happen, like what happened to me, I was held accountable. And it's like, yeah, you know, I, I to speculate on it is, you know, I'm not comfortable speculating on that. Yeah. Maybe other things that happened um, with other people and, you know, you know, I, I don't, I don't know. Um, you know, it's just bad, bad decisions. And, you know, you, you try to overcome it, you know? Yeah. And you were never, uh, like you said earlier, I think you, you were never really into the drugs and the, and the, the drinking and stuff. So th that was never your vice. Correct. Yeah. The, the, uh, I was straight edge. I was always straight edge. Um, so I don't have any excuse. I was drunk or high or anything, but, um, but I was, you know, I was, uh, I felt like I was, you know, uh, trying to be an example. Like you can live a rock star life and be straight edge like Ted Nugent or Gene Simmons. There's straight edge rock stars out there. They kind of inspired me to, you know, be straight edge and you don't have to lead that party lifestyle. But yeah, there's girls around, um, and of course you don't know the ages of girls, and it's you know it's it's a uh, it's a dangerous thing. You know you got to be careful, and uh, you know all my experience, like like talking about in prison and and going through all this, um, you meet a lot of people that talk to you about things and say, hey, um, what happened to you, or how could this happen, and other people come up like, hey, dude. I could have been me, dude, you know, like, are you okay? You know, it's like, everybody knows there's irresponsible behavior going on, you know? Yeah. Are, are you like, when you're in a rock band like that, and there's just girls flying left and right, like, is it just kind of a thing where uh, like she's good looking, she's good looking? Do you not care about ages? Or are you specifically looking for younger girls? And you're just not worried about ages and not checking IDs or whatever? No, no, like, uh, yeah, I mean, you're not looking for any, you know, a girl is attractive and, you know, guys just make bad decisions like that, you know, because obviously besides ages, there's also diseases out there, pregnancy. There's a lot of like consequences of bad behavior, irresponsibly. Mm -hmm. But when you're living that lifestyle, you roll the dice and you do things that you regret. You, you do things you may not regret it. You may not have to suffer the consequences as I did. And you just keep people on going and you feel invincible, you know? Mm -hmm. Well, it's kind of like, uh, yeah, I mean, in a way it's, it's like uh, driving drunk. How many people have done that? And, uh, you know, just not paid attention. Right. And, and uh, you know, some people right. go to jail for that and uh, they kill people like Vince Neil, or uh, they mm -hmm. don't get caught. They don't get in an accident and uh, they just right. move on with their life. Right. Yeah. And, and in my case, it's like, I, uh, I accepted responsibility. I've talked about it. I don't like to belabor the point about it. It is uh, something that's not admirable. It's shameful. And it's something that I regret. I've got a lot of remorse. I've been through a lot of therapy and counseling, understand motivations, understand, you know, the way I was thinking. It's called thinking errors, cognitive distortions, you know, and you understand where you were at the time and, and things like that. So uh, if it can help anybody, you know, to say, you gotta be careful, you know, it's like, and, and I've, I've been told that by all kinds of people like, Hey, you know, should have been more careful. You should know that people lie about their age and, and things like that. So I was a teenager. I, I should, I should know that I should have known better. It's that simple. So, mm -hmm. um, but I, I look for, um, you know, um, reckons, or I look for, you know, forgiveness, maybe, uh, you know, and that, you know, you can give somebody a second chance and that you can learn from your mistakes and not ever make them again. You know? Yeah. So you mentioned that you went through counseling. So what was the conclusion of, of all that counseling? Like, what did you learn about yourself and this behavior? Oh, that's exactly what I just said. It's, it's thinking errors, like, like thinking about things and not, um, not considering the consequences you just you just go and you just assume things and you just it's thinking errors like oh it'll be okay and and, and mm. you know it's just like without getting into details you know but you just you 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 rationalize things and you assume things that you shouldn't you know so i've learned a lot about that um many times over you know definitely yeah. what Went through a lot of count. I go through voluntary counseling because you got to stay on top of things, and just to, to you know, because people are judgmental, and 
rightly so. They can be judgmental. So to know that I'm doing everything I can in my power to um, make uh, make people understand that I am, you know, remorseful for what I did. I'm very careful not to ever let that happen again. And people evolve. I mean, as you get older, risk factors go down, and it's not the same. You know, it's not the same scene, not the same world anymore. You know. Yeah. So when you're in but, jail, talk about that time because what is it like? being stuck in jail your band is out on tour there i'm sure they're doing great i don't remember what tour they were on they were probably on some great tour you're stuck behind bars yeah i don't know how long you were in prison for was it a year or two or yeah it was two two it was two okay so you're in there for thanksgiving christmas mm -hmm. days like what is that like I, I i just that's like kind of one of my biggest fears is is going to prison i feel like that would just be so awful is it pretty bad yeah it's you you look for um you know, you try to see, you know, you try to see good in, in different things and you make the most of it. You know, if you're out, if you're lost out in the wilderness or you're whatever, you're in some unbearable situation, you make the most of it and you go into survival mode. And I'm shocked I survived because I, I feel like I'm a wussy, you know, like, you know, like <laughs> I can't, you know, I don't know how I survived gangs and, you know, all, all these different things i mean around murderers and gang members it's, it's scary stuff <laughs> well, yeah i was gonna ask you so like how did the other prisoners treat you because on the one hand you've kind of got rock star status you've been in dope and the murder dolls and static x but on the other hand with those kinds of charges that's kind of like a target in prison right it can be but if you're honest about it you diffuse it and i was in a situation where i was just honest about it and uh people who would maybe beat up or murder you know people with certain charges right mm -hmm. they they were understanding they said listen that's not you're not a child molester you got to know girls ages you know it's like that's not molest molesting a child you, could, you know so people in gangs that would normally you know rough you up or kill you or whatever i for some reason, maybe I'm stupid, but I said, let me just be honest. And they, some, they had empathy for me. <laughs> Weirdly enough, you know, people, I mean, hardcore, like skinhead gang members. Wow. Scary. <laughs> yeah. I was just like, you know, some, I'm just going to tell them whatever, <laughs> Let's see what happens. <laughs> and because I was upfront and they respected me in some weird way, I was like, you know, I don't agree with people with swastikas on their arms. But, you know, you know, I was just like, they want to do something, they're going to do something. What are you going to do? So I was honest and they respected that. And they said, that's not, you know, we, we wouldn't harass you about that. You mm -hmm. just got to be careful, you know. And I've had corrections officers and different people in different situations, like actual police, corrections officers, officers of the court, ask me questions like, what are you in for? And I tell them, I go, oh, yeah, you got to be careful these days. So, hmm. you know, I understand. Like, like I, I, I took responsibility. It's, it's, it's a, uh, it's a thing that's um, that's shameful and it's, a, it's, a, it's a terrible mistake. Um, but I mean, I was in the situations. I was in facilities with people that did horrible, horrible, horrible things. You know, so it's like it, I'm like. Phew. Thank God, you know, I just got this little bit to do here and I'm going to get on my life. So mm -hmm. it's like you you count your blessings, mm -hmm. you count your blessings and uh, you got to recover from it. So, yeah. so, so when, to some degree, yeah, go ahead. Oh, I was just going to say like, because um, I, I mean, my show is all about like learning and, and from mistakes. And I think that's what I'm trying to do. I'm trying to trying to help you. Maybe some people think I'm crazy for for having you on the show, but I, I just want to learn about this and and try to learn. So for one, on the one hand, people that might be going down some sort of path like this where they need to be more careful about checking ages or uh, like you said, the thinking errors. But also I want to and I, I'm not blaming the parents at all. Like, uh, obviously, you know, I'm sure that there's they feel terrible about what happened. But is there something if if people that have kids, what what could parents do to prevent this with their kids? Like, do they need to monitor their kids online behavior more? Because isn't that how you met some of these girls was online or something? Yes. Um, yeah. Monitoring, you know, it's like 
but like if I had a daughter or even son, you know, you, you want to be careful and explain to them or go with them to the concert, you know, don't drop them off and then come mm-hmm. back later. You, you should monitor things. And I mean, that's, that's what I would do, you know, for sure. So I think, yeah, there, there's, it, there's a certain level. I mean, you know, the industry is what it is. I mean, it's like, like I, I, I don't want to um, pretend that the industry is this certain thing and I'm just this outcast. I got in trouble for something. Maybe, you know, were a lot of people doing it? Possibly, you know? What do yeah. you think? I, yeah, I don't know. I mean, you you would know better than me. I mean, and I'm not excusing or <laughs> condoning your behavior because um, even you admit that you made a mistake, but I always just look to understand, like, I know with Janie Lane, um, I'm a big warrant guy. I'm a, like, there's a poster back there if you could see oh, it. Okay. But, um, but I know that, uh, you know, there was a rumor, and I don't know if there was truth to this, that he that he was molested by uh, an older rock singer. And I don't know, they never said who it was or what happened, the details, but he ended up dying, obviously. So I'm just going to throw that out there. Was that ever something that, were you ever a victim of abuse yourself or, or as a kid? No, absolutely not. I mean, and... Um... In my situations, um, everything was it, it, consensual. You know, it was consensual in the, in the in the eyes of the detectives and all the um, investigators. It was always written. It's it was a consensual experience. So, you know, I, I, I'm taking responsibility, but I don't want people projecting things onto things that aren't for real. So, like at, at one point, I don't want to, like you said, you don't want to make excuses or excuse anything. But you want to be very clear, right? You know, I'm not, you know, like what you're saying, like people did things back in the 80s and the 90s, all the way up to the present day. There's things going on. People aren't checking ID. And it's, you know, a tragic thing. And it's it's something to, you know, be aware of, be more aware of your parent. And if you're a musician, be aware, you know, you're thinking, you know, with your sexual desires and you're not thinking straight, you know, and you add drugs and alcohol to it, which I don't. It never did. It's like it adds to all that stuff. So yeah. it's like you got to got to be careful. And for my my situation, I I hope to you know uh, be able to show people I, I've I've learned from my experience. And yeah, it's it's a it's a tragic thing. But this is this is something that you know goes on and needs to be addressed. I mean, as be, as best you can. You know. Yeah. How do you get through the guilt? Because I mean, you got to be guilty, feel guilt for, for what you did, you know, with the girls and then their families. But then also, like, I, I heard you talking about how, you know, it, you also hurt, obviously, your band and your career and your own families and your friends, because now they've got to deal with that. So how did you work through all that? Oh, it, it was it was difficult. But a lot of people, um, you know, understand the culture um, and understand there's a culture of irresponsible behavior. It's rock and roll. I mean, you know, uh, the, so, I mean, I, it's like, you want to pretend that it's not what it is. It's, it's rock and roll. It's, I, I should have known better, but there's a lot of things that have gone on from these days to present day, you know? Mm-hmm. And it's like, all you can do is say, it's something that is nothing anybody can be proud of doing drugs, uh, young girls, alcohol, and every other kind of irresponsible behavior that, that you can say it's, it's something that goes on and, you know, just to be more careful and learn from it, learn from yeah. other people's just, mistakes. Yeah. I mean, it seems like it's something that's going to haunt you. Like, do you have to, you still have to like, do you have to register as a sex offender? Is that still a thing? Or do you like, at some yeah, point you get off? Right, right. Yeah, it's something that it's, it's limited. It's definitely. Oh, limited, okay. But so, yeah, it's it's something. Yeah, it's like, yeah, it's, you know, what I mean, you know, it's it's hard to talk about because it's something that I'm trying to move past. You know? Right. So, so it's something obviously like I've talked to everybody in my life about it. I've talked to the members of Static X, Dope. I've talked to everybody about it. And seemingly people were pretty understanding, you know. I mean, the people in my life were understanding if I talk to you, you know, off the air, you know, it's, there's a certain thing that people can understand, like, um, you know, you made a mistake. Is the mistake forgivable or not forgivable? All right. Being with someone um, who's underage and going through this, 
and understand the circumstances, is it something forgivable? Um, I, f I hope it is, you know? I, f I feel like it is because I've hung out and talked to people in the business, rock stars, backstage, hanging out one-on-one, -on -one, and nobody treats me like a pariah. They treat me with respect. They, how you doing? Are you okay? Questions like you're asking me, you know, in an interview situation, ask me, you know, one-on-one. -on -one. Are you okay? Some people don't address it at all. It's like, hey, Trip, how you doing? Good to see you. And hugs and everything else. Because in a way, they know, they understand. It's like, what what happened to you, dude? Well, they, they understand. They don't got it. Very few people like, explain to me all the details. They kind of understand what I went through. And it's um, or what, what I did. They understand what I did. What I did that was irresponsible. They understand how it can happen. You know, just like you've implied, you know, how does this happen? You kind of people kind of understand how it happens. It happens with irresponsible parents, irresponsible musicians. Combine the two, and you know things happen that are unfortunate and shouldn't happen. Mm -hmm. Yeah, well, so, I just we try to encourage everyone to make good choices for sure. And, and obviously, you know, yeah. we've you've made the mistake, and you're hoping to learn from it. Now, so what did you you get out of jail and whatever what would have been like 2007? You didn't start mm -hmm. the face without fear until 2019. So what are you doing for that hiatus? That's like 12 years. What did you do during that time? Were you just in hiding I, kind of or? I played music. I was going out to shows. I was hanging out with people. I was hanging out with people that I knew from back in the day. Bands. I go out to shows and hang out with people that I was touring with i hung out you know and when i run into people anybody i run into that i was on tour with or that i knew from different musical professional situations everybody treated me good you know i there was like maybe one incident where a comment was made after i left someone told me oh someone called you a name after you left but then the next time i saw that person who i won't name the next time i saw the person hey how you doing trip how you doing how's it going and now what's the real person everybody puts on acts phony real phony real i don't know you know why call me a name and then you see me face to face and you're like ah how you doing maybe calling me the name was just a virtue signal in front of everybody and this is the real him or is this the real him and that, who knows you know but uh do you regret feel so i was gonna say do you regret being away for so long like do you wish that you would have came out of prison and just said I'm back. This is what I do. This is music. I'm starting my band right now. Like, do you have any advice for other, you know, quote unquote, canceled celebrities or musicians? Like, should they just get back on the horse right away or should you hide out for a little bit? Um, I felt like keeping a low profile was maybe doing something like, like still rebuilding things in my life and, you know, doing counseling and, and showing people like I'm not right out there again. You know, so I kind of did it. I kept low key on purpose. I regret it now, though. I should have came out and just played because I, I, I wasted a couple years there uh, and I could have been, you know, I was writing music the whole time from 07 straight. I was writing music, writing lyrics. A lot of the stuff I have out now with Face Without Fear is um, stuff that I worked on those, you know, kind of the quiet years. Of, uh, so I kind of regret not doing I could have. I talked to the authorities and they said, yeah, you can, you could tour. I could have toured in 07, you know, I could actually, go, you know, I could have been doing stuff. So, you know, things happen, like I said, for things happen for a reason. So, you know, I, I was, um, I was engaged and I got married. So I was trying to, you know, build a life, you know, at those years I was trying to build a life. And uh, so I, I kind of laid low on purpose sort of, mm -hmm. but I kind of regret it now, you know, cause face without fear was actually began in, 20 the seeds of it began in 2015 so okay. i started music and uh, like auditioning musicians in 2015 so it was like you know it was like oh seven eh, five it was five six seven years then then i started working on some you know who's going to be in my band and you know i started working with some musicians and you know yeah people obviously like my past is there it is what it is and you know if you know people were understanding they wanted to play with me you know did you but ever think of uh, doing like behind the scenes kind of stuff, like producing bands or managing bands or giving guitar lessons or things like that? Like being in the be kind of behind the scenes more? No, nope. Because I feel like, you know, a certain person said to me, dude, this is, I'll quote, I can name names here. Edsel Dope said to me, dude, this is America. 
Everyone deserves a second chance. You're a good person. You rebuilt your life. You deserve a second chance. He said that so, to you? Yeah. So he's yeah. supportive of, of you. He was. He was, was. supportive. He was. And Wayne Static was also had your back initially, but then maybe later didn't or something. Right. So the fact that I rebuilt relationships in 2012, Edsel offered me to join Dope. So never mind 2015 with Face Up here. In 2012, just a couple of years later, uh, he offered me to join Dope. He's like, hey, why don't you come play with Dope? He wasn't didn't mention one peep about my background or my legal troubles. So 2012, he was like, let's go, dude. Let's do some shows. Let's get let's get you out there. So I had to go through, through some red tape. It didn't work out, mm. but it, it it very well could have. It didn't work mm. not work out for him. It didn't work out because of some legal things at the time. So we were going to press go and keep going 2013. And it got so um, involved and he, he had my back a hundred percent. He wanted me to be his, you know, part, business partner at that point in time, it's, you know, and then I, then I reconnected with Tony Campos reconnected with, and then, you know, so I was, I was reconciling with everybody and reconnecting with people. So, but what went wrong? Obviously that's the big question. Like, what went wrong? You know, and that's there in my issue right now. It's like I had people that had my back and uh, looked past everything that you and I are talking about now, looked past all these things. And uh, basically, um, let's go. Let's work with Trip, writing songs together, making plans together and everything else. So that to me was it was like 2016, 2017 when we reunited Static X and I was on, even though I wasn't playing it, I was on top of the world because I'm like, I'm reconnecting with all my old dudes and we're writing songs and working on something together. They don't mind that I had this background and we're working together on stuff. So what happened? Pretty cool, right? Yeah, so what, what happened? Why did it fall apart? Well, what happened is if you read any of the articles or interviews I've done or press releases is, I didn't like what they were doing with the music. You know, I didn't like, you know, music is everything. Writing songs is like the heart and soul of everything, right? Performance is great. That's why I wouldn't ever want to not perform. But writing the songs is the meat of everything. Writing songs, a song you heard on the radio, writing music is where it's all at. So, um, you know, so I didn't like what they were doing with the music. You know, they, we had these Static X songs and some unreleased material. They start changing it. And Tony was originally like, I want everything to be authentic. And then something changed, something changed. And then the songs start. And these are songs that me and Wayne wrote. So I'm supposed to sit there and be like, oh, yeah, just do whatever you want with them. And they weren't communicating with me. And I didn't like it. So I ended up having to get a lawyer because they weren't communicating with me. I had to lawyer up and, you know, you know, start sending letters. It just sucked. Like we were working well together. And then, so now they kind of use my background as an excuse, like, oh yeah. And they kind of like position that. Well, then you didn't even, I mean, not that they weren't concerned about like addressing the press. Like, oh, why are you working with Trip? Well, because everyone deserves a second chance. He's a good person. He did his dues. He, he made amends and he's getting his life back together. And the context of what I did, if what I did was, a certain level of crime. Obviously, you don't want to work with somebody who did certain things. All right. Um, so it was enough to work with me and to carry on working with me, make plans in dope in 2012, static X in 2016. Hmm. So and I reunited with Rough House. So there's dope, static X, Rough House, three bands I was in signed with all working with me all accepting my past and saying, let's go, dude. Let's go Rex from Rough House. Let's go trip from Dope. Let's go trip from Static X. So what went wrong? That's why I have to do some interviews. I need to talk to people and get the word out that this is not, something's not quite right here, you know? It's like they have my back and now they want to stab me in the back. These are songs that I wrote with Wayne. And no, we're going to change them. And guess what? They changed them. I couldn't stop them. You know, it's cost too much money. <laughs> it costs too much money. Yeah. You still get the songwriting credit, but ultimately 
it's they own the songs or something or they can change it to static x songs so right or how does that work well there, there's uh it's like it's like i said before it's a little complicated sometimes um because it was um yes i got credit for some songs and other songs i didn't get credit for so it's like the songs i didn't get credit for is where i'm kind of uh, hurt i mean it, it's hurtful very hurtful when you wrote stuff and then someone's saying oh uh he's lying about that um they know i'm not lying about it. i'm telling the truth but they're going to say i'm lying so it just it gets into this he said he said thing you know it's like he said she said he said whatever <laughs> it gets it gets crazy but it's it's a sad thing because these are songs i wrote with wayne and even how about wayne's songs that i didn't write with them they're changing those so they're, they're giving the fans this watered down let's put our name on everything to make more money for us type of thing so yeah i'm accusing them of doing it for the money it sucks i have to say this i mean it sucks because i love these guys on one level and i was working with them and i wish i could work with them wish i could have worked with them but they decided to change everything and they knew i would have protested it so they had to kind of like change the game here so is this something yeah. that you can work out like with the reconciliation or is this something that's going to have to go through lawyers or I've tried, you know, I've tried, uh, talk, talking to them, reaching out to them, but they're like, go away, go away. You can't hurt us. Go away. We got you. We got you. You know, it's like, it's almost like, gotcha. Ha ha. So mm -hmm. at this point, all I can do is express the fact that they did this. It's not right. I got credit for a couple songs. Yes. Um, so they can say, oh, we gave trip credit, go away. <clears throat> yeah, they gave me credit for a couple songs that were written and copywritten back in 2005. But there's songs that we worked on since then, since 2016. There's songs that I worked on with the members of Static X. And how do you, those, is there a way to prove that? Or how does that, I mean, is it just like you said, he said, he said, or is this, do you have like uh, timestamps on this stuff? Or I don't know how that works. Yep. Yeah, I got timestamps. I can prove everything. Oh. Okay. And I, I can lay it on the air. I can, um, I could, I, I'm planning my own podcast. Uh, it's going to be called the dope on static X podcast. So I'm going to go kind of behind the scenes on some of this stuff, talk about good memories. Like, you know, I just talked about tonight, talk about, um, what, what's going on with static X now, what's going on with the album they put out, what, what, how they really did it. And some of the inside information that I have, you know, it just, it's it's sad, unfortunate, but there's still people that want to, you know, kind of rip people off. Even to this day, it just sucks. But unfortunately, like, well, then take them to court. It's not that easy. I've, I've talked to the highest level attorneys. It's like three dollars chasing after one dollar. Yeah, you can stop somebody, but you know, people steal things all the time and get away with it. Um, unfortunately, hmm. unless you're, you know, unless you're Disney or Marvel or something big. You know, which is one of the same now, right? <laughs> like, yeah. So, the, yeah, what, so, yeah. So what are but you I, doing with uh, Musical.ly? Oh, sorry. You know something else? But I can prove it. I can prove these songs are mine. I got the old cassette tapes. I got the CDs. Forensically, they can be proven what the date is. I mean, just huh. logical progression of things. You can listen to something and go, all right. That's that music that goes with this vocal. And I got I got stuff like archived that like in storage that, you know, you know, of demos that I haven't unearthed yet. Like the original demo for Die MF Die. You know that song, the dope. Yeah, song? Murder Dolls. No, dope. Die MF Die. Oh, that's Die. dope. Yeah, no, sorry, that's dope. I yeah. love that song. That song's great. So I co-wrote that with Edsel, right? It's their biggest song. Biggest song. Um I can't find the original demo. <laughs> I know it's somewhere. I have it somewhere in the mm. archives. I just haven't found it. I found my original demo for the only. Um, and it's pretty cool hearing the original demo. And I'm, I want to release this stuff. I want to, you know, get people behind the scenes who like it, who understand things. Um, but, um, but yeah, it's, it's unfortunate that to prove something in court costs so much money. It's like I said, it's $3 chasing after $1. So, mm. They kind of negotiated with me, but they negotiated with the idea that what are you going to do about it? We're static X. So what are you going to do about it? And they kind of know the thing. So things that they offered me, we'd negotiated for a little bit, but I just, I, I didn't feel good about it. And, and Wayne's memory is an important thing to me. Wayne's memory. They claim to, you know, 
want to honor Wayne, but changing Wayne's music to such a degree ain't cool, you know. So I feel like I gotta, you know, I gotta speak out. I gotta release stuff. I'm gonna be releasing my own, you know, unreleased Static X um, music and stuff to show people some of the original versions of things. And it's gonna be cool, you know. People will be able to hear, you know, how the songs originally were, and they can you know, decide for themselves. Okay. And then are you doing a, a version of Static Static uh, Static X, like a band, like a Project X? Is that, is that what it's going to be called? Yeah, what I have is um, I'm working on Face Without Fear. That's my main yeah. project, Without Fear. Um, we were doing some Static X songs. We were covering a few Static X songs with Face Without Fear. <clears throat> the guys are really talented that I'm working with. <clears throat> but I want to release the Static X stuff. So this has really believe it or not nothing to do with static x what they're doing i would be doing this regardless wayne's widow ex or wife was going to release wayne's thing wayne's material okay if she would have released it i'm sure she would have made sure it was as close to the original as possible i'm sure she would be like hey let's uh you know put other people's names on songs so it probably would have been handled a little better if she did it because it was her husband you know so I want to release the stuff more true to form. I don't care if it doesn't sell. I don't care. You know, I want people to hear the songs in their form, not about money. It's about the integrity of, of the music and making it as uh, true to form as it is. Now, if there's unreleased demos or unfinished demos, you got to finish them, but you keep them true to the original intent and then you just finish them, you know, as opposed to. It would be Wayne singing. I have Wayne's vocals, yes. Yeah. Can I release them? Yes, I can. Will I release them? Eh, maybe, maybe I will. Maybe I will. But I, regardless, I want to put out the music with the new singer I'm working with. I got a singer that's very much in Wayne's style that I'm working with. I'll be, I'll be announcing who that is. Um, he's a big Wayne Static fan, and he you know loves Wayne's style. I got a bass player. I got a drummer. So it's it's kind of a Static X band. Is there I'm any gonna, X members of Static Static X in this band? Just me. Okay. <laughs> yeah, but um, it's, yeah, I call it Project X right now. Um, Static X was called Project X hmm. when I was with them in 2016. I'd label everything Project X. You know, just keep it secret. Project X, Project X. You know, so it was something that I was like a nickname for the project we're working on, Project X. So somehow, all of a sudden, Project X became Project Regeneration. You know, so it's like, you know, all right, it's a, it's a, it's kind of a cool, like, kind of my calling it the project. So Project X, my new Project X, which is going to be a Static X style band, is going to have a different name. I just haven't released the name yet. Okay, so it. you'll do that and Face Without Fear. You'll have those two bands. Right, I'll have two bands. Oh, I got. I'm actually doing Rough House as well too. Rough House. Oh right, yeah, band. that's right. You do them too. So yeah, it's like similar thing. Um, uh, the Static X band, the, the Project X band. Um, I'm just taking my time on it. I want to start releasing stuff. I want to do a teaser and kind of like introduce the world to these guys I'm working with and the music because the music's awesome. It's it's songs that were worked on for Static X. Songs from 2016, 2017, 2018 that we were working on that they're never going to do hmm. because... Can you say any of the song titles or anything? Um, one's called "The Forgotten Man." One's called "Uncontested." So that might that might change, but those are the names right now. They got cool lyrics and stuff. It's definitely static. Sign and Tony Campos co-wrote these songs. So hmm. these are songs I was working on with him recently. Okay. Some of the songs were written, you know, maybe four five years ago. Some of the material. I gave him a bunch of my music in 2016. I said, Tony, check this out. Let's get Static X back together. So basically, yes, I'm taking credit. And pretty much he admitted it in so many ways that I'm the one who got the reunion going. You know, I called him up in 2016. He's like, no, I'm not really, I don't know. You know, and I said, well, let's just do it, man. Let's work on some music. I got these, got these old songs. we got some other new stuff we can work on. And then he said, okay, let's do it. So yeah, I got the, I got the reunion going, you know? So it's like something that he wasn't interested in doing. He turned Wayne down, but he said yes to trip kind of weird, right? Hmm. Yeah. Wayne, 
Wayne asked him in 2013, let's get Static X back together. Let's get a new record deal. And he's like, no, don't want it. Not interested. Screw you. Then I asked three years later, I said to Tony, let's get Static X back together. And with not many, much more than a couple of days, he goes, okay, let's do it. I sent him two CDs worth of material to review. I said, this is all the material I got working on. Here's some old songs. Here's a bunch of new stuff. Here's stuff I wrote in the last 10 years, my quiet years that I worked on. And he, uh, he went through it all. I said, go through all these songs. Go, yes, no, maybe. So then we'll trim out. The yeses for sure, the maybes. So we have some on a back burner and those clear those out. He went through my two CDs full of material, went through it all. And we started picking out the cream of the crop. And some of those songs, Face Without Fear is using. Some of the songs will be with Project X. Um, but they didn't end up with Static X. And I, I believe, of course, I'm biased, but I believe they sound more like Static X than the new Static X album. You know, but oh. fans have to judge for themselves. You kind of like when you put an album on and it says Static X and you listen to the album, it's like, yeah, it's Static X with well, the names there kind of like influences your opinion. You know? <laughs> but mm -hmm. uh, I don't feel it's Static X-ish enough. I think like they change the songs too much. You know, Static X is simple. You know, it's okay. a simple, you know. Well, I look forward to that. So when will that stuff be out? ASAP. Um, we're working on it right now. Um, we've been working on it for a while, you know, so it's like, I, I, I take my time with things. There's no rush, but I'm, I'm hoping to have something in the next few months, like, like to release one or maybe two songs to give people an idea and, and maybe shoot a video with these guys, you know? Hmm. So I'm, I'm really excited about it. these guys have become friends. Um, the guys are like, you know, they, they're fans, a couple of guys are in their thirties, they're fans. So they kind of feel the vibe, but I, I want to keep a strict, like static X vibe to it. So th something I feel like project regeneration volume one, in my opinion is, is it just, you know, it's not quite static X enough. They, they change the songs too much and they change, they flip things around too much. But I think, you know, with my project, we're going to pay attention to detail and it's going to be definitely uh, more of a static X sound. Okay, cool. Well, I look and forward to that. We're going to be covering some static X songs too. Just like here's our updated okay. version. And then you'll be some. doing live shows as well? I'm not sure. I'd like to, but uh, Face Without Fear is playing live. So I'm not sure the Project X, it depends. You know, if we all feel good, we, we all jam and we feel good together. We haven't worked jam together in a room yet so hmm. this is all like remote working on things right now so if it all feels good we'll play a show for sure yeah okay have you, you guys haven't toured with face without fear you've done shows but you've, you haven't done like a full-on tour right right no we haven't toured it's just been some one-off shows um covid kind of you know dampened things and and we had a drummer a desert for a while for like a year we didn't have a i was working with three different drummers and hmm. <laughs> to find the right drummer is, is uh, you know, but we finally got a guy now. So, you know, I got a drummer for Face Without Fear and a drummer for Project. For a while, I was using one guy for both projects, but now I got a guy for each project. And it's, uh, you know, I'm, I'm excited about all of it. I mean, the Face Without Fear stuff is like, I love the music. And it's like, we have uh, full albums worth of material. Um, I want to get it out there, too. We're, we're probably going to put an EP out first, though. Hmm. We got some cut different things we're going to release first. Yeah. But. Well, so like well, part of like the redemption, I think for people is, uh, you know, good things that they're doing in the world. Like, tell me, do you have any stories of people reaching out to you and saying how your music has helped them? Like I hear, I feel, I feel like every musician has a story like that. Yeah. Yeah. We, yeah, we've, uh, we've gotten like, yeah, definitely some people from back in the day that, that, you know, send messages out and, uh, you know, like, Oh, trip, you know, you were so nice to me and you, you know, you know, you really, uh, you know, inspired me and, and stuff like that, like people from back in the day. And, and those stories are always encouraging and inspiring and stuff because I got stories about meeting rock stars, bad stories, and then great stories, stories where someone was a jerk to me and stories where they were just inspiring, you know, just like amazing you know, stories. So, so stuff like that, like, uh, you know, so yeah, I mean, th those kind of things inspire me because I know, I mean, you know, you have an influence on people. And I like to, you know, I, I felt like I was a positive influence on, on fans being straight edge saying you don't need to do drugs and alcohol. But, but dude, it's like people close to me. I've had people super duper close to me that know 
that I don't do anything. And still they went down the road of destruction and addiction and suicide. You know, I've lost so many people to suicide in the last couple of years. It's just heartbreaking, heartbreaking, you know? So here, and then a couple of people to drug overdoses, you know, losing Wayne and Joey Jordison, the two people that, you know, believed in me and gave me a chance and worked with me are gone because of drugs and alcohol, you know, just, just sad. I mean, there's other the other issues too, health issues and stuff that play into it. But yeah, yeah, it's rough. Drug addiction, it just you know, those are things that are just you know. <laughs> you know. Speaking of which, like I know you, um, sometimes you talk about charities and stuff. There's a you know what yeah. rock to recovery, rock to recovery. You know that? No, uh, I'm not sure if I'm familiar with that one. Tell me about it. Rock to recovery. Um, it's it's a it's an organization. I I haven't reach out to them but i was like you know wayne i think it's they deal with this some famous musicians i think it's based out of california um i should have done a little more homework on it but um i think that that's the group that i was referred to by wayne's old manager saying like i was trying to get wayne to go here mm. and um i was never able to but um i'd like to work with them as a charity just because you want to do something positive because that's how wayne you know struggled and that's that's what eventually you know, ended his life. And uh, I know Joey Jordan struggled with addiction and stuff like that, too. So, you know, to do something positive and, <clears throat> you know, work with a group like that for awareness and everything like that. It's, it, it's never uh, I mean, people who are addicted don't want to deal with it, obviously. But you got to you got to talk to people if you love someone and they're they're on something or they're just feel hopeless. you got to, you know, try to get them help and show them that you care, you know. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. Well, I'll put that link in the show notes. And then is, do you have a website or you're not on social media? I don't think so. Is there any other way for people to follow what's going to be all the stuff that's going to be coming? Yeah. Well, face without fear um, has social media. Okay. So I'll be using probably the face without fear um, websites. We'll use them to promote the other projects, but, but eventually yeah, project X will have its own, you know, um, YouTube channel and social media. But yeah, Face Without Fear can be found. There's no other band with that name. So you can find the band on YouTube, Facebook, Instagram very easily. Um, and then there's a facewithoutfear.com. And there'll be a tripeisen.com um, very shortly. It's already built. It's just a matter of um, it's going to be really, within the next week or two. I'm going to launch tripeisen.com, which will also kind of host my Soup, my, my soon to be uh released podcast so podcast, i guess yeah, yeah so, so the, yeah the podcast gratuitously is going to be named the dope on static x so yeah. it's going to talk about dope fun memories the fact that you know i worked with dope from the beginning and, and there's a lot of good memories there talk about murder dolls talk about static x talk about you know good memories from all those days different tours different albums like we'll focus on different episodes it'll be an episodic thing like a limited maybe 12 episode type of podcast so okay. i'll talk about teen album one episode the shadow zone album another episode murder dolls another episode dope another episode and then the new static x which i'm sure it's going to make them uncomfortable talk about that another episode and talk about some of the behind the scenes how the song developed what my role was in certain songs that i was or wasn't credited for and you know just get that out there because i feel like I got to get it out there. Maybe somebody will be interested in like, Hey, I love this album. How was it, you know, how, how was it written and stuff like that? So, you know, if, if people love the new static X album, you know, I, I'm proud of certain things on it because I wrote, you know, they, they charted on iTunes. They charted on a lot of things with songs that I wrote. So hmm. well, I'd be proud of that. Okay. Well, cool. We'll look for all that stuff. That's my material right now that, uh, present day that that charted so like why should i not be proud of it yeah no very cool you've had a prolific career it's a, it's amazing all the things you've done so we'll look forward to new music and uh that podcast very cool yeah excellent yeah so yeah tripizen.com and then the podcast will be hooked to that okay well thanks so much trip i'll talk awesome. to you thank you all right bye-bye bye-bye well there you have it trip eisen uh opened up about a bunch of things including his legal troubles his current issues with his ex-bandmates, other musical projects, and more. And I understand there are some people who will never able to get past what he did. And that's okay. Uh, you have the freedom to follow his new products, projects and go see him 
or if you never want to support him or anything he does, you have that right too. Uh, but hopefully you at least listened to this episode and heard what he had to say before you made that decision. Uh, if you enjoyed this interview, check out some of the other ones I have and make sure to subscribe for future episodes. If you hated this interview, uh, you should still check out some of the other episodes and subscribe because you might like some of the other ones. Thank you for listening and all your support. Have a great day and shoot for the moon. <laughs>